to this important general conference of international association of Tamil journalists. Since you, people in the audience, and not myself, are the experts of the grave, si grave situation for post-war journalism in Saralinka, Sri Lanka, I will not talk so much about that particular situation, but rather share some general insights about professional and legal challenges on a global scale for conflict reporting in these troubled times for journalism. The fact that Sri Lanka finds itself on place 165 out of 179 countries listed in Reporter Without Borders Press Freedom Index says a whole lot about the grey situation for media and journalism in Sri Lanka. I got some insights <coughs> in the difficult situation for and working condition for journalists in Sri Lanka when I, in 2008, had honor in capacity as jury member of the award Global Shining Light Award, uh, a pre prize for investigating journalism delivered in the Norwegian town of Lillehammer in August 2008, delivered that prize to Sunila Samarasinghe from the Sunday Leader for a fantastic series of articles on corruption related to the government. When I visited Sri Lanka in November 2008, I talked to Sonila and she expressed real concern for safety for journalists included target killings. It made a deep impression on me that just two months later, her own husband, editor of Sunday Leader, La Santa Vikrama Tunga, was shot and killed in his car on his way to work by two assistants on a motorcycle. It was amazing that he himself, on his desk, had left a note making clear that he understood what danger he was in. <coughs> he wrote, I hope my assassination will be seen not as a defeat of freedom, but an inspiration for those who survive. <coughs> so now, that, after that, left for the United States. The year after, in 2009, I was shocked to witness the brutality of the military and government of Sri Lanka. Lanka in my mind, President Rajapaksa should be held legal and moral accountable and responsible for potential war crimes and killing of so many innocent civilians at the later stage of the civil war, particularly, of course, in the Tamil area. And there are also the related issues like land grab, but that has been mentioned earlier. <coughs> I will just mention that the lack of willingness in media, I would say on a global scale, to demand legal consequences for the atrocities is highly relevant to the topic I'm <coughs> going to talk about. And reading the introduction to the conference program, as well as many recent reports from Reporters Without Borders and committed to, to protect journalists, I found that journalists in Sri Lanka are still killed physically attacked, harassed, and prevented from doing their jobs, seemingly without much legal consequences at all. In the book, you see the front page there, I have written with my Swedish colleague, Stig Arne Nordstedt, to be published in a couple of weeks. We argue that it is a connection between the increasingly physical danger for journalists covering new wars and the lack of focus on legal aspects concerning human rights violations and disrespect for humanitarian law and international law in the day-to-day -day conflict reporting on a global scale. A central theme in our book is how legal issues have been blurred and underreported by the media 
in all major conflicts since the Gulf War in 1991, the war in Afghanistan, the bombing of Libya in 2011, the attacks on Gaza in 2008 and earlier this year, the recent bombing of the so-called Islamic State in Syria and Iraq, and the ongoing use of drones in countries like Yemen, Pakistan, Somalia, and Afghanistan, and the so-called Islamic State. In 2001, the United States began arming unmanned aircraft systems, so-called drones, with missiles. They were used in the battle for the first time early in October 2001. And in our book, we refer to <coughs> hearing in the US Congress on April 28, 2012, where several of the principal issues involved in the use of drones were discussed. The academics and experts on international law that was invited there criticized the U.S. administration and its senior lawyers for not having expressed any views as of the leg legality of the use of drones and target killing practices. By the way, I have not seen this report mentioned in any news ma media. I find it myself when I was on a sabbatical at the University of Berkeley in the library. I read it there. It's there. It's clearly it's very outspoken and very well documented, but for some reason not mentioned. In this debate, all the legal experts that talk seem to agree on one issue. There are no <coughs> legal problem in using drones per se, but using drones in a situation where U.S. are using drones towards a country that, which there is no declaration of war is not according to international law. Of course, there are some arguments also legally used by the U.S. government, the same as they use in the global war on terror, that is a sort of self-defense. They also, sometimes I mentioned they have the, the authorization from some of these governments, including Yemen and Pakistan. But still, these killings have victims that are rights according to international law. A study with, that we present in our book uh, showing how U.S., Swedish, and Norwegian news media underreport the legal aspects and, and report drone use in news items <coughs> on a daily basis without mentioning the fact that these are legally questionable and most probably illegal. Underreported is also the fact that more than 3,000 innocent people have been killed in drone attacks. Documented by this report in uh, by University of Stanford and the Bureau of Investigating Journalism. As you're full aware of, where there is injustice, there is also resistance. <laughs> and this artistic expression aimed at the drone pilots who actually see what's happening in detail on the ground, showing the picture of one of the victims. Uh, a strong argument against the claim that they are just Al-Qaeda terrorists that are targeted. And in Pakistan and many of these other countries, there are growing anger and resistance towards this unlawful killing. In our book, 
we underline the significance of the Gulf War in 1991 as a point of departure, not only because it was a breakthrough in the military media management of the media and breakthrough of the di direct satellite uh, transmission 24 hours, seven days a week with CNN as the only global channel at the time with this technology. This created a unique moment in media history explained by George Gerbner, the media scholar, in this quotation. The boiling point is reached when the power to create a crisis merges with the power to direct the movie about it. The Gulf War was legal in the sense that it had a mandate from UN Security Council, where UN's <coughs> were authorized to lead a coalition chasing Saddam Hussein's forces from Kuwait, the illegal occupation of Kuwait. What is left noticed is that the United States, United Kingdom and France, at the very end of the Gulf War, implemented a no-fly zone formally to protect the Kurds in the north and the Shias in the south without a UN mandate. This was used after that, constantly to launch air attacks by U.S. Air Force without a U.N. mandate, all the way up to the illegal war in our Iraq in 2003. So, in contra contradiction to the French philosopher Jean Baudrillard's assertion that the Gulf War never happened, an ironic commentary of stating the importance of television, we rather suggest that the Gulf War never ended. We also argue that the Gulf War may haunt us in decades to come because of the created anger among Muslims all over the world due to the fact that Muslims fought against Muslims in violation of the notion of United Muslim Nation al umma And the fact that the terrorists from 9-11, a majority from Saudi Arabia, the fact that this anger has been building up, I think also has something to do with what we see in today in the so-called Islamic State. Another direct effect of the Gulf War was the creation of Al Jazeera Channel as a global 24-7 channel in 2006. <coughs> People in the Middle East could not accept to be left with the only U.S. Western perspective in the global war news war reporting. Of course, there is a connection between what has happened on 9-11, what is happening on a global scale with all issues talked about earlier today and the global war on terror after that created an atmosphere which criminalized not only terror but all sorts of resistance which you very well know and have talked about I will not repeat all the arguments that that has made it difficult <coughs> even for opposition on Sri Lanka, and of course the very difficult human rights situation documented increasingly with torture on a global scale in the name of the global war on terror. <coughs> All these atrocities well documented, leaving the moral and legal legacy of the Bush doctrine in a troubled, harmless way. I've been asked by the Norwegian UNESCO committee to conduct a survey among war reporters in eight countries. Unfortunately, Sri Lanka is not among them. Even though this study is not yet published, and therefore I will urge you not to use the data because it's not finished, but I wanted to share it with you today because the findings are quite clear. It's based on in-depth 
semi-constructed interviews with journalists in Tunisia, Uganda, Nepal, the Philippines, Colombia, Nicaragua, and Norway. <coughs> the journalists were asked how many times they have experienced threatening situations or being <coughs> directly threatened in their job and in relation to their work during the past five years. A majority of the respondents report on threatening situations between two and ten times they personally have experienced the last five years. And the effects of it are chilling, the lasting effects with post-traumatic stress, psychological problems, sleeping problems, etc. It has another effect. First, how is the threat expressed? It can be personal to them, it can be to the family, it can be direct in telephones, it can be in emails, uh, even threats with weapon. Scaringly many of them have been threatened with weapon during their job. So, what is the consequence of this? Too early to say, but one findings that seem to be clear. More restrictions, both in terms of self-restrictions by the editors and uh, by the media owners to send reporters on the ground to conflict zones because the risk has been so imminent. We can see it in Syria. Who dares to send reporters to report from Syria? I will come back to that. But um, this is threatening for journalism. And we argue in the book that this security situation and the lack also, <laughs> for some reasons, uh, to report on the legal aspect of that threat undermines the very job the journalists are doing. And they also therefore should be aware of reporting legal issues in the stories they write about the conflicts. We now see a grave situation uh, where actually the group calling themselves the Islamic States have taken control in Syria and have a media management system. In Huffington Post, they published very recently the ground rules that this Islamic State present to the journalists. You can see it on the list there. I have uh, no time to refer it in details, but there are 11 points. And basically, to be allowed to report there, you have to support the caliphate. You have to be religiously loyal to the, the so-called government there. You have to show the stories to them before it's published. All kind of very, very detailed restrictions. And of course, from time to time, rightfully, Western governments and military has been criticized for putting too much restrictions on journalists, for instance, in embedding system and similar system. We have discussion all the time, Israel government in Gaza, US government in Iraq, the, the journalists want to be free, there are some restrictions, but this kind of restriction have the world never seen before, trust me. And it's really, really horrifying. And not less horrifying is, of course, uh, the propaganda movies where journalists, for propaganda purposes, are executed on camera. And then, of course, there is the response, the air attacks against these groups. Again, we see the legal issues not being very clearly reported, if reported at all. 
these color pictures occur and is reminding me of the uh, propaganda war in the Gulf War in 91, where you see procession weapons hitting buildings, no human sites, no human beings, no civilian sufferers, no people, basically, on camera, because the signal is we are be doing a very clean human warfare, just hitting precise goal. Again, we see this kind of images, even though we know already by now that there are civilian casualties. Lacking a UN mandate, Pentagon media strategist apparently now had found a new, even more dangerous group than Al-Qaeda to blame. Had any of you heard of the Khurasan group before this happened? This was a new, alleged, even more dangerous group than Al-Qaeda. Glenn Greenwald, the well-known Guardian journalist, uh, breaking the Snowden case, wrote in his blog that the suggested group seemed to be a pure fiction. According to Grievo, the Obama administration prepared to bomb Syria without congressional or UN authorization, and it faced at least two problems. The difficulty of sustaining public support for a new year's long war against ES a group that clearly posed no immediate threat to U.S. the homeland. A second was lack of legal justification for launching a new bombing campaign without no way variable claim of self-defense or U.N. approval. There was no U.N. mandate for this bombing. So the solution to the problem might have been to create an even more dangerous threats than we saw on 9-11, the Khorasan group. So the spin around this group went around for a few days. I haven't heard it mentioned since. Those very first hours after the bombing started. The legal issues are uh, also very much at stake in the propaganda war in Ukraine and the situation around Ukraine and the Russian actions there. Both President Putin in Russia and the US government are driven by a military logic we have not seen since the Cold War and they are both using legal arguments against each other in the propaganda war. When Russia illegally interfered in Ukraine through proxy holders, the indignation by President Obama and Foreign Minister Kerry was seemingly to be shocked. And they stated, you just don't invade another country. I could not believe it. What a nerve these guys have. Have there no shame looking at back at the chaos they left behind after the illegal war in an invasion in 2003 based on the lies or weapon of mass destruction. <coughs> it's a fact that Al-Qaeda did not exist in Iraq during the brutal dictatorship of Saddam Hussein. The chaos now created by the invasion uh, and the creation of the Islamic State in parts of Iraq and Syria shows that the chaos is complete and there is a connection with, with the you don't invade another country in Iraq in 2003. Unfortunately, media also in small countries like Sweden and Norway uh, are dependent on big power alliances. While Sweden is formed in neutral and Norway a loyal NATO member since 1949, 
they de, de facto have now became military allies within the ESOF framework and through the doubtful misuse of UN Resolution 1973, as you see on the picture, which was authorizing <coughs> no fire zones over Libya. The Libya case is perhaps the best example of media's lack of ability to critically report on your own government and military when they are in a war modus. Nordstedt and I in the book and several other publications have showed in cases like Gulf War, the global war on terror, the Iraq War, Afghanistan, etc., the clear finding is that there is a significant correlation between the framing of the wars and the security political orientation in a given country. If we go back to NATO's illegal bombing in Yugoslavia in 1999, Sweden uh, was not a part of this, and cr Swedish media were actually quite critical and wrote about the danger for a possible third, war, third world war, the uh, concern of this new high conflict level in Europe, etc., while Norwegian media mostly applauded their F-16 pilots and planes where they circulated over Belgrade. But then it changed. While both Swedish and Norwegian forces joined the ranks during the ESOP umbrella on the ground in Afghanistan, both Swedish and Norwegian media lacked the will or perhaps competence to analyze the critical issue whether the UN Resolution 1368, which acknowledged the right of US to respond to the attacks on 9-11, uh, also could justify a war lasting more than 10 years. If you read what leading legal scholars in Norway write about the issue, they claim that Norway's participation is unconstitutional, illegal, and could end up with charges in the International Criminal Court. This cri criticism was and is not reflected in the Norwegian and Swedish mainstream media. Another related matter is, of course, that there came a UN Security Council resolution giving ESOF a mandate <laughs> to secure areas in Afghanistan, as they did after a while in Iraq. The long-term pro problem for this is, of course, the President's UN then create, in retrospect, legitimations of international law because the invasions were illegal in the first place. If we move to Libya 2011, we saw a further development in the Norwegian-Swedish military <coughs> relation. This time around, <coughs> Norway took active part in the bombing with Swedish planes with support functions. In our book, uh, we discuss this, and sometimes when we talk each other over a beer, we say, we started this re research project 25 years ago almost. Would we then believe that a couple of decades later, Norway and Sweden would actually be cooperating or bombing a country in Africa? If you look at the content of Resolution 1973, Three, the text states that a no-fly zone is to be implemented to protect the people in Benghazi from a potential attack by Gaddafi forces. Leave aside here the discussion how likely that threat was. The important thing is that NATO used this resolution to implement a new strategy without authorization by the UN for regime change. And, of course, we all know the results. That prevented, among other things, uh, the African Union to enter Libya to conduct a mission to try to find 
a peaceful settlement. Another shocking failure, this is the Norwegian biggest newspaper when the bombing started. Ready for bombing, the only the, uh, that thing that lacking it is like a subtitle hooray or something. It's, it's enthusiastic, patriotic, supportive. And of course, uh, protecting the civilian population was the was the aim. And the mail, and this is how it looked in the hometown of Gaddafi after the war was over. The town totally shattered, not primarily by NATO bombing though, but by the resistance forces. And there you have another shocking failure of reporting. The fact that armed Islamists took the weapons supplied to them by US and Arab countries like Qatar and went directly into Syria and started and joined the civil war there with their own operations with the very same weapons. Others co-responsibility for creating the Islamic State they are now fighting. Rather than thinking a self-reflexive position on this kind of issue, we once again see the media are swallowing the propaganda base as this new fiction group in Syria. The numbers of killed journalists in the last decade is shockingly high. In Syria alone, 27 journalists were killed between 2011 and 2013. Two thousand and two hundred journalists and media personnel are killed in the period between 1989 and 2010. There have been some attempts in the UN system to protect the security of journalists. UN Security Resolution 1738 of December 2007 do states do state that <coughs> journalists are protected strongly in the conflict zone. The problem is that it's not respected. So uh, I think I'm beginning to use up my time now. Uh, yes, so I will end soon, but just briefly try to answer what can be the solution be. And we discussed some alternatives in the book based on Johan Galtung's model here for peace and war journalism. Uh, Johan Galtung suggests a war-orientated journalism focusing on just two parties, while the peace journalism is to explore conflict formation. Uh, War journalism just blame one side. Peace journalism see the conflict, the war itself as a problem, etc., etc. I will not go into detail. But we suggest also that discourse, analytical approach with legal uh, scholars should be used. And before ending, I just want to mention one issue. And then I take my academic hat off and my freedom of expression and human rights activist on. I'm also a member of uh, Penn International, the Norwegian board, with branch all over the world. This is an organization specifically to protect journalists and authors. And you see the dots here with all the, the countries that have pen organization. And if you see Sri Lanka, there is no dot there. So my actual suggestion is that freedom of expression activists in Sri Lanka try to create an international pen center. I will personally assist that by the headquarter, help of the headquarter in London, because that really gives a base to work towards the government. We recently have now had <coughs> successful work in Turkey where 
So now our members have been following court cases, demanding release of journalists, and it is working. So this is my suggestion. Thank you for your attention.